Thanks for joining us for today's webinar on how affiliates can amplify their content with SEO. Now, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Blue Taylor. I'm a part of the publisher development team here at Commission Factory and have been working here for just over two years. I would also like to introduce our guest speaker. Today, we are joined by Usman Kapadia from MyDark, who has over 12 years of experience in digital marketing and SEO within the UK and Australia markets. He joined MyDark early this year as a head of marketing and is a big advocate of leveraging SEO for achieving website goals. Thanks to Usman for joining us today. I'm going to invite Usman now to present. Hello everyone. Um, Nice of you to join us. Um, I'm going to go through uh, how can affiliates amplify their content with SEO. So a quick agenda. Um, so I'll go through some fun facts about SEO. Um, we'll talk about what is SEO is. Um, SEO strategies for publisher. Um, common SEO mistakes and the impact of those mistakes. How to align your content and your SEO strategy. Um, and then tracking your performance um, and, how, and what, what's the benefits of tracking your performance. Um, before we start, uh, we're going to have a poll uh, running through. Um, the, the question of the poll will be, are you currently taking SEO into account when publishing new content? Very good, very quick. Thanks everyone. Um, some interesting, interesting results there. I can see that 79% of people are taking SEO into account, uh, which is great to hear. That's how it should be. Um, we'll also talk about um, you know, how you can go to the next step after that. You know, So if you are taking SEO into account, what, what else can you do from an SEO perspective to optimize even further? So here's some fun facts. Um, some of these facts I had no idea about till recently. So first one. For every click on page results in Google, there are 11.6 clicks to organic results. Um, it just shows that the behavior change in people in terms of you know, doing a lot more research, a lot more questions are asked, and that's where organic um, is a lot more prominent in search results. Um, this has happened a lot. I know I've done this myself, the second one. According to research, around 30% of all internet users are now using ad blockers. Um, Again, you know, this is important from a, for, a, for publishing affiliates because you want your people to see your content and your articles. So organic is a way of sort of going around this as well. Um, this is a good one as well. 50% of searches, search users uh, begin their search with mobile. Um, so, and this is increasing as well. So I think this is really important to understand because, you know, mobile sometimes doesn't take into account when people are designing the websites or creating pages uh, uh, in terms of how it should be done. So that's important to know. And this one's, this one's a great one, and it's a new to me one. 55% um, of marketers say blog content creation is their top inbound marketing priority. So, you know, that means A, they think about blog, but B, what makes a good blog? You know, it's about making sure the content's relevant and optimized correctly as well. So what is SEO? Um, I'll do a quick, simple explanation about what it is. Um, nothing too technical here. So, you know, you can see on the left-hand side, in terms of visually, what paid search and organic search results look like. The biggest difference will be, you'll see for paid search results, there's a little sort of black, uh, it is black now, but it does change. Um, it says ad, and that's just letting people know that it's a sponsored ad rather than a uh, organic ad. Um, organic results, organic results are two, so it's the maps is, is considered organic as well, but also organic results are um, anything to do with images as well, that could be considered organic and then the actual organic results themselves. Um, the main difference, SEO is all about leveraging a search engine's algorithm. Um, you know, leveraging the algorithm so you can improve the quality and quantity of the traffic to your site. Um, Pay-per-click is, is a lot more dynamic. It's an advertising model where you pay for clicks. Um, 
And the reason why these are both important is because, you know, as, as someone once said, the best place to hide a body is page two Google results. Pillars. Um, I think SEO pillars is something that every, everyone has, when every agency has, everyone has from a strategy perspective, what are the four most important things? These are the sorts, I think, probably the four most popular pillars from an SEO perspective. Technical foundation. So is your site, web, is your website technically sound? Um, are there any issues from a crawlability perspective? Are all the technical functionalities that you need to have, you know, like robots, text, sitemaps, are they in place uh, on your website? Uh, on-site SEO. So this is the on-page stuff. This is really relevant, I think, for search engines and for users. But you know what people see from page titles to H1s to content, is that all optimized? Is that all correct and, and, and relevant to what they're looking for? Authority and trust. So this is to do with domain authority, um, the number of links coming to your website. Well, not just the number of links, but the quality of the links that come into your website. You know, um, How is that looking? What's your portfolio like currently? Um, local prominence, um, it's a new one I've added. Um, it's because the, the importance of maps and, and people trying to be visible in their local areas, not along with being obviously visible in the national space as well from an online perspective. Um, the, the other reason why local prominence is also really big is mobile. Um, so if you go to your mobile now, and back in the days you would type two, three years ago, you type in running shoes, you might not always see a map. But now when you're on your mobile, if you type in running shoes, you haven't, you haven't actually specified a location but a map will always be appearing because Google thinks, search engines think that you're on the go, you're looking for a result that will display near what's near you kind of thing. So maps has become really important in terms of visibility, brand awareness, in terms of strategy and all that kind of stuff as well. Google's ranking algorithm. So this is a little thing that was done, created by um, a, a website, Ahrefs. Um, you'll see here, there's, a, there's, there's so many different factors in terms of Google's ranking factors. The reason why I brought this up was because you'll see some of the top ones are to do with content and keywords and, and article based stuff, which is what, you know, affiliates and publishers do a lot of. So you see, you see the top one, relevance of your overall page content, really important. The third one down, you know, using of query relevant words and phrases, really important. Exact match keyword use, again, you know, all content based, all about how you do content. Um, having query relevant entities in page content, again, you know, really, really important stuff. And then also things like location, frequency, and distance of related words. These should all be taken into account when you're writing content and, and publishing content as they are a ranking factor for Google. So some strategies, um, some of these strategies, I mean, there are for publishers, but you know, it could be for affiliates and, and all other types of marketers as well. Um, keyword selection, probably the most important, I think, in terms of uh, strategies, it will dictate not just your strategy in terms of keywords, but your content, your audience, your behavior activity, all that kind of stuff. Selecting the most relevant keywords is, is a key factor in terms of doing a really successful SEO strategy, but I think it would be successful any kind of digital marketing campaign as well. Um, what are people searching for? Um, what's their language and behavior from a keyword perspective? And are you relevant? Are you, are you targeting that same sort of language and, and behavior uh, with your content? Um, as I said before, keyword selection will help dictate your SEO and content strategy. SEO content strategy should be aligned. Um, they should work together and they should use keyword research to, to align that. On-site SEO, yeah, I mean, it's really important to make sure you get it right. Um, you know, in terms of importance, I think technically from a, a SEO perspective, that's the most important area, get, get your technical stuff things right. But the second is your on-page. Um, URLs, are they tidy? Are they relevant? You know, when someone looks at your URL, do they understand what that page is about, especially search engines? Um, the other thing about URLs is uh, if people can remember a URL quite easily, then they can, they can you know, type it into Google quite easily as well. So that really helps as well. It makes it easy to follow. Um, title tags, they are your first impression. Um, so when you go to search engine results pages, the biggest thing you'll see for any, when you type in any kind of query um, is the title tag. It's the biggest sort of form of text. It's normally underlined as well. Um, so getting that right will influence, you know, not only search engines, but user behavior as well. Um, meta descriptions are also important, not a ranking factor, uh, meta descriptions, but they are when it comes to click-through rates. It's those, it's that two, it's those two sentences before um, people make the click that they will read and understand what that page is about and go, yep, Actually, you know what, this page is exactly what I'm looking for, I'll click through. If they read it and they don't, then they think to themselves, oh, I'm not sure that's exactly what I'm looking for, then move on to the next one. So it's really make sure it's really important to make sure it's relevant and there's call to actions on those meta descriptions as well. 
technical SEO. Um, I'm a big fan of this kind of stuff. I don't. I do think people think technical SEO is all about sort of firefighting and fixing issues and fixing broken issues. Kind of thing. That is the case sometimes, but it's not always about um, fixing broken issues. Technical SEO can be used to improve performance as well. You know, things like ensuring your site can be indexed. I mean, that's really important. Uh, can Google go from A to Z on your site and see everything they need to see? If they can't, what's the problem? Why not? Um, I'll probably think. I'll probably say technical audit probably the best way to start off any SEO campaign if you're starting from scratch. Um, a technical audit will allow you to understand what are you doing right, what's really good, what's not good. You know, where are you, where are your weaknesses? What can you do uh, better and fix? And what's the impact of making those fixes as well? So, a technical audit will probably be the first thing I would do for any SEO strategy, and then go from there. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, things like AMP, schema markups. Um, looking at page speed. These are technical fixes you can do which can actually improve performance. Um, and, you know, they're not about firefighting, it's about improving performance uh, from a technical perspective. Internal linking. So, uh, internal linking is almost, you know, it helps the credibility and the user experience. So, it does two things at once. Credibility because Google understands if you've got an article, for example, let's say it's coming up in the Melbourne Cup uh, and there's an article about um, seven ways, you know, seven styles of how to dress for the Melbourne Cup. Very popular with women and men, and how to dress for the Melbourne Cup is always, is always a good uh, talking point. But if you've got an article just about that and there's nothing else on your site that's relevant to that, and there's no, nothing linking to that page, then Google thinks of it just as a landing page, really. Whereas if you have other articles or if you have you know other pieces to do with styles and, and how to dress up for events, all that kind of stuff, and they all link to these sort of pages, you're creating an internal structure which will help Google understand these, these guys, this website or this publisher is not just talking about this for the first time, but they've got other articles that are relevant to the same space. Um, it acts like a bridge. So, you know, not just for users, but for search engines. Read this page and I want you to come to the next page after that and then the next page after that. Now, the next page could be, you know, your, your partner's website, for example, or it could be a call to action as well. Um, and I think the call to action thing is really important because many times you come to an article, you read the article, and there's not a call to action to be seen, there's no internal links. The user doesn't know what to do after they've read the article. They, the most likely action is they'll read the article, they'll be like, thanks for the information, and they'll leave. Whereas what you want them to do is read the article and then follow a next step, whatever that next step is of the, of the journey that you, that you want them to follow. Um, and using internal links to do that is, is a really powerful way to do it. Common SEO mistakes. Um, I do want to say, in terms of common SEO mistakes, a lot of these are not done, you know, on purpose. They're, they're, some of these are accidental. Some of these people are not aware of. Um, SEM Rush did a, an article recently about, you know, sort of the common top common mistakes that can be done from an SEO perspective, and I think it's relevant not just to, you know, I think it's relevant to everyone from an SEO perspective. So you can see here. 404, 403 codes, for example, very common error codes. 59% uh, of all people, uh, all research, research domains, had this as an issue. You know, when a user or a search engine can't access a certain page, um, they frown upon it. They don't like it. it. It's bad user experience. It's bad search engine experience as well. Um, 404, I think, probably is the most common. I know I've mentioned 403 here as well, but 404 are very common. It's very, it's very simple to fix a 404 issue. You know, you, you put a 301 redirect, for example, or a canonical tag to fix a 404 issue. But that doesn't solve the long term of the issue. It's, it's trying to understand the error. So why does this error keep occurring? Is it because I'm disabling products? Is it because I'm, you know, um, the article's old or I've changed the URL or whatever you've done? Something's not, something's not working correctly. And it's trying to fix that and understand that. And that will stop the issue happening rather than having to keep putting, you know, band-aids on it as you go along. Bad page titles. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of websites uh, have this situation where their, their page titles are not optimized. They're not. They're not unique. For example, um, you see it a lot. It's it's a really common mistake, and I think the impact of fixing this mistake is really is really high in terms of, you know, it'll improve your visibility, it'll improve your relevancy, it'll improve your experience from a user perspective and a search engine perspective when they land on these pages or just before they land on the pages as well. Um, also. If you don't have optimized page titles, then there's a very good chance that your competitors, whoever they are, would, would rank above you and be more visible than you and get the traffic that you should be getting instead. Um, so I think, you know, making sure that your page titles are optimized, they're unique as well, and they're relevant um, is important. Going back to the keyword research we talked about, you know, if you know what keywords you want to target and what sort of audience you want to target, it makes it a lot easier to optimize your page titles as well. 
the HTTP is still around. This, this, yeah, this is still happening, uh, which is a shame. But um, a few years ago, you know, it was all about the HTTPS pages. It was from a security perspective that was the way to go. Google announced that you know all pay, all websites that are not HTTPS will be you know not the word is not penalized, but it will be you know scored down from a from a ranking perspective. Uh, it became a ranking factor to have HTTPS in place. Um, it's critical to Google, but not just Google. Other other places, other platforms as well, like like Facebook, like Instagram, like Yahoo, like Bing, all those sort of platforms as well. It's really important. And for users as well, um, and for browsers, is to have HTTPS in place. Um, a lot of people did move to HTTPS, and you do see that most of the websites are on HTTPS now. But what's happened is when they've moved to HTTPS, they've still got the old HTTP page, which is live still. So what's happening is you've suddenly got two versions of your website, and both are counted as separate domains and separate URLs. So you're almost getting this duplicate issue, um, and you're diluting your website's credibility from the beginning before you've even started optimizing. Um, so I think it's really important to make sure A, HTTPS is in place, but also making sure that HTTP is not around and can't be seen. Can't be seen. Mobile first, um, you know, most of us in the industry are aware of this. It's a big factor over the last 18 months. You know, Google now indexes and ranks sites based on a mobile first approach. So it's not about how you look from a desktop perspective, but it's how you, the website and the web pages look from a mobile perspective. Are they mobile friendly? And then the speed of those pages as well. You know, is it a slow loading site? Is it a quick loading site? The quicker the site loads, the better. Um, it's also important that Google's given, it's made sure that people have advice about this. So what they've done is they've created tools which are free to use, um, the Google Page Insight tool and the Google Friendliness tool, where you can actually understand, um, is, my, is my website mobile friendly? Is my website quick enough from a Google perspective? perspective? Um, they also provide tips on why they're not. So it's not like they're just leaving you in the lurch. So, and, and the reason why they're doing all this is, is because of the rise of the importance of these factors. So I'd, I'd really encourage people to look at their mobile sort of performance and their mobile speed um, going forward and making sure that the speed's as optimal as it can be and that your web, your web pages are mobile friendly as well. Um, things like AMP, accelerated mobile pages, they play a really strong part in improving mobile performance, but it does depend. There is a caveat. It depends on how your site's configured. You know, not everyone can have can have AMP in place, um, but if you can, I would check that. There are ways of checking out through tools. If you can, I would definitely have that implementation and done. It makes the pages a lot faster, a lot quicker, and it's search engine friendly as well. Aligning content and SEO. So this is a, this is a slide a lot of agencies talk about, and I think a lot of people will see this slide. It may be different images, different words, maybe slightly, but the message is the same. You know, when it comes to content marketing, get your research done, do the keyword research, understand, you know, what you want to be relevant for, understand what you want to be visible for and when, you know, seasonality plays an issue uh, factor, sorry, in this as well. Um, then the strategy, you know, who do you want to target with this content and, and, and when as well. Um, putting a strategy in place like content calendars is, is a really good way of doing it. Um, making sure that you plan ahead um, is really important from a strategy perspective and where you're going to put the content. You know, which platforms will, will have this piece of content, which platforms might have other pieces of content, depending on the nature of the content and the audience you're targeting as well. Um, creation of content, um, again, really important to understand from a creation of content, who's creating the content, when are they going to create it? Is someone reviewing the content that's being created um, from an SEO perspective? It's really important to do that. And from an audience perspective, um, that's really important to do. Then optimizing that content. So if it's not optimized from an SEO perspective, Make sure it is, you know, page titles, um, internal linking, for example, like we talked about before, uh, call to actions, internal linking on blog articles, really important to make sure you don't lose your users straight away. Um, so doing that kind of thing, can can the page be indexed? Sounds really simple, but making sure it is, is it in the sitemap? All those sort of things need to be considered for point four. Then amplification. So this is, you know, this is where you, publishers and affiliates really come into their own in terms of, you know, you have a really good piece of, you have a really good article. Where does that article get published? Who sees the article? Where do you, where do you, where, what platforms do you put it on? Um, with the Melbourne coming up, well, Melbourne Cup coming up, there's a lot of articles that are going to be going around about that, tips, how to dress, where to go, all that kind of stuff. Um, making sure it's amplified from a social perspective, making sure it's amplified even through paid search. It's a really way of doing it. Uh, emails as well. Uh, I always think, you know, emails are good for telling people about offers and, and deals and stuff, but also about good pieces of content that you have. You know, you know your, your, your audience want to know more about a, a particular topic, send them an email. Let them know you have this article as well. Be a source of truth uh, for people uh, when it comes to content marketing. 
content strategy. Uh, I came back to this because I think if you, if you can get this right, everything else will flow into place. You know, what is your USP? Why are you guys? Why your why your website? Why why should people listen to your tips or benefits or your your product or your service as well? Um, what's the intent of that of that article? Um, you know, is it is it to provide ideas because people are? Is it to answer questions? Is it conversion based? Are you trying to get someone to you know do a particular conversion, whether that be an inquiry or a transaction, whatever that might be? Make make sure you understand the intent of your content. Um, what's your competitors doing? Have they, have they done similar, similar pieces of content in the past, like last year, for example? Um, what are they doing from a, uh, are they getting all visual on you? Are they, getting, are they getting videos instead of content? What do you want to do? Do you want to do videos as well? All that kind of conversation needs to happen internally. Um, and it's also good to know what people are doing because that will influence your audience and where they go and also how you do it and your strategy as well. Um, making sure it's unique, the content. It's very easy to copy and paste articles from big news sites or, or you know, um, making sure that it's it's not just unique, but engaging as well. And I think, you know, things like top five, top seven tips, very, very good way of doing content, I think, uh, when it comes to ideas and styling. Um, and doesn't have to always be text. I think people think content should just be a, a bit of text and it should be, it could be videos, could be infographics, which are really popular as well. Um, could be all that kind of stuff as well. Could be just memes and stuff like people sometimes just use that. Uh, it's a very popular way of talking to your audience these days. Um, so that's good to do as well. Um, and then the, the content hub itself, the content hub could be the blog, could be your, your news page, for example. What's the structure? What's the tags? What's the categories within that content hub? Um, and where does it sit? Um, for some people, you'll notice a lot of websites have changed the way they where they put their content. It used to be in the footer. It used to be hard to see, but now they've put it in their navigation as a main point of focus because they want people to go to their content hub, blog, whatever you want to call it, and, and read their ideas and tips and use them as a source of truth, um, which is important to do as well. And you see on the right-hand side here, example of sort of content calendars people can build as a starting point. And then that's to do with like public and, and national holidays and stuff, but then you can make it more specific to yourself as well. Can you start now? Of course you can. Um, I think actually in terms of publishers and affiliates, content is your main collateral as it stands anyway. Um, so you have probably the biggest tool, should we say, in terms of reaching audience is good content. But, you know, you, you sort of tweak a few things, like, for example, changing the approach, you know, factor in the audience, factor in what, what, are, what are people searching for that relates to what your article is about. You know, and how can you tweak the words of your article um, to match that? Um, and then search engines as well, you know, making sure that, you know, we talked about it before, but, you know, you, you're doing some really good pieces of content, but can search engines see them? Can search engines actually understand the theme of that content, the topic of that content as well? Um, start monitoring activity now. Um, you know, I think most websites have Google Analytics in place or other tracking tools in place, um, but monitor the activity of that particular article or, or set of articles. Um, what's, the, what's the end goal? What's the performance you're looking to get? And are you getting that performance? And also look at the past. You might not have done that before, but you've done obviously done articles in the past and published them before. Um, which of those have done have had a success? And try and look at why they've been successful and where the people come from to find that article as well. Um, and the other thing you can do, and, and I, I, re I definitely recommend this, is anything you've written over the, over the sort of last six, seven, eight months, you know, go back to that content and maybe update and revise that content based on what we just talked about, based on keywords, based on audience behavior, and update that content, and then let people know you've updated the content. You know, you see a lot of times people have a date stamp on their, on their articles and their, and their pieces of content they've published. You can quite easily go in there and just write updated, for example, and the, and the new time and the new date, for example, and let people know, yep, I've gone back, I've changed it because I want it to be more relevant, I want to be more visible with my content. There's no harm in or, or shame in doing that. Um, and in terms of tools, I've mentioned some tools at the bottom left here. You see, you know, the likes of SCM Rush, Ahrefs, um, Moz, we talked about before. Screaming Frog is a crawling tool. The good thing about these tools, most of these tools are free to use initially. So you can at least, if you haven't used these tools before, you can at least trial them and see, you know, do they work for you? You know, SCM Rush, for example, and Ahrefs is really good to understand not only what are you doing, but what are your competitors doing in the same space? It's really good to do that. Screaming Frog, uh, that one, that tool there, it actually allows you to see how many of your pages are being crawled correctly and how many of your pages are not being crawled. Um, so some of those tools are, are, are free to use, and I, I would encourage people to go in there, start the trial. If you actually can look at it and go, you know what, this information is really good, carry on using it, and then work out, does it work for you from a, a cost perspective? If it doesn't work, then obviously, you know, that's fine, that, that's understandable. But I definitely recommend, you know, those four tools as a, as a, as a, 
starting point to understand the audience, understand how you're doing and your competitors. And then Google Analytics is another tool I'd, I'd recommend, obviously, but I don't think people use it enough uh, in terms of their data. Um, so that I'd recommend using that tool as well. Track your progress. Um, really, really important. You know, a lot of people do a lot of good work in terms of content detail, but they have no idea what's the engagement levels around that content. Um, are they getting are they getting the traction they want? They, they don't really know um, why. And if there's if it's not working, why is it not working? You know, so things like how, what, why, who. So how how did people find your website, your article, or your, or your website? Should we say how did they arrive? From what channel? What platform? Uh, was it organic? Was it social? Or was it actually another referral site? Um, you can you can track that kind of activity and understand what's working, what's not working. What do they do when they land on your website? They landed on a particular page, but you know that that's just the starting point of your journey. You want them to go onto another page and then you know make that inquiry or, or go to your partner's site. Did they do that or did they not? If they didn't do that, you need to look at why. Why did they leave your website? You know, we talked about it before. We've, I've done a lot of analysis before where people have landed on these really good article pages. They read the article. We know they read the article because they've been on the, on the page for a minute and a half, for example. But they, they, then they just left. And you, and you look at the article, you realize that there's nowhere to go next. There's no call to actions. Um, and then where do they go as well? Then who? Uh, you can customize Google Analytics to capture this kind of data. But you know who is the age group of that person? Where do they come from in terms of location? Where, where are they based? What device do they use to the point of actual iPhone 11 kind of level device information? Uh, and then the affinity categories, you know, what else do they look at in, on the web um, from an audience perspective? Um, all good information to know when it comes to creating campaigns and understanding your audience as well. And what to track? Um, I think before you start any campaign, goals and KPI should be defined. Sometimes it can be really simple. Sometimes it can be, I just want traffic from this article. I want people to land on this website and read my, read my article and that's it. So sometimes it can be a bit more where I want them to land on my website and then make an inquiry or get in touch with us or land on my website. I'm talking, I'm, I'm working with a, a partner and I want them to go to the partner site. Whatever the goals and KPIs, they should be defined first. If you define the goals and KPIs, you can then understand how you're going to track it as well. Things like bounce rate, I think, you know, from a content perspective, huge factor. People land on your, on your website, they read the content and then it, they just leave. That's not what you want to happen. You want, to, you want them to engage the website. You want them to learn more about you and learn more about your partners. Um, so tracking bounce rate is important. Um, how's your organic visibility? So you've made all these SEO changes, you've done the technical audit, you've done all that work. Has it improved your organic visibility? Is it, is it performing better than it was before? If it's not, then you need to look at why not. If it is, then you know, you're in a happy place and you want to carry on improving that. And then we talked about it a few times already, are users reaching the end goal? So what is that end goal? Are they reaching it? What's stopping them from doing that? Um, are you happy with the campaign? Um, and then once you're tracking the first few campaigns, you can make improvements for the next few as well after that. Um, so good to do. Key takeaways for today. So um, again, SEO is a long-term plan. Everyone will tell you that, you know, people will say three to six months before you see any results. I do think there's always quick wins though. You know, the way we do it at Mind Arc here, we, we look at quick wins. Always make sure you've identified some quick wins that you want to happen within a month or within a few weeks. What are those quick wins and have I achieved them? Plan for it with that mindset. There is a long-term plan, but I can achieve quick wins. It doesn't have to be completely long-term. Technical SEO is the foundation. It is the foundation. Making sure that your website can be crawled, has all that technical functionality in place is important. And then build on it. You know, use the on-site SEO we talked about, you know, the page titles, the URLs, the, the meta descriptions, all that kind of stuff. And then the content itself. Um, you know, build on that on top of the technical foundation. I think if you do really good on-site and content via technical is a mess, you're going to struggle a little bit in terms of visibility and performance. Um, make sure you determine the right keywords. Any strategy, for I think, for any digital marketing area, it should be about the right keywords for you and your audience and understanding what that is. Um, internal linking does help everyone. It helps you. It helps your users. It helps search engines understand your site and the depth of your site as well. Um, SEO mistakes do happen. Sometimes they happen because you know, of the platform itself. It, it, just, it just hasn't been configured like it needs to be. The important thing is to identify and find ways to identify those issues, fix it, obviously fix it straight away, but then prevent it. Make sure it doesn't happen again. What can you do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And ask that question as well. Um, content is your performance catalyst. Content is a great way these days to improve performance. Good content, good engagement, traffic, so on. Uh, and then track your performance, you know. Know what you should and shouldn't do uh, from a from a performance perspective and from a 
campaign perspective, tracking your performance allows you to see that information. So a few jokes. Um, some of these jokes are quite cheesy, but I love them, actually. So you can see here, SEO expert walks into bars, bars, beer garden, hangout, lounge. You're thinking, what is he talking about? That's almost like a keyword research kind of joke. So you know, you use all particular kind of keywords to understand this is how an SEO person would talk uh, from a content perspective. Um, and then the other one is, uh, then the client said, I want to be ranked by tomorrow. So we get that a lot, uh, especially for an SEO. If it was paid search or something like that, maybe feasible. But from an SEO perspective, that's not going to happen. And you know, it's a, it's a very common conversation to tackle. Uh, there's a few more here about 404s. So you know, the SEO conference room was in room 404. I laughed when I saw this, uh, but yeah, you obviously can't find it because it's a cruel error. Um, and then what is a black hat SEO's favorite food? Spam, spam, spam. So, yep, pretty good. Um, okay, cool. So um, in terms of questions, I'm going to bring in uh, Blue and she'll, she'll handle the question situation. A big thank you to Usman right. for running through that presentation. And thank you so much to those who have already submitted questions. We also invite those who haven't submitted questions yet to do so now. Okay, some of the questions sent in have already been answered in the presentation. Yeah. So we will be going through questions that have not yet been covered and answer any unanswered questions. We'll follow up directly and for general SEO questions, they will be answered on the blog. So the first question is, can the platform you use hinder your SEO performance despite the content you publish? Yes. So um, there are, I mean, how a platform is configured can affect your SEO performance from a technical perspective. Um, you know, if it's not configured correctly, then it'd be hard for search engines to understand or see pages. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, I worked a lot with Shopify and, and Magento and WordPress. If it's configured correctly, then it's perfect. It's really good for SEO. It works really well and everyone gets all the visibility one. But I have seen instances where they haven't been configured properly um, for whatever reason. And websites have struggled to be visible, even though they've got really good content, they've got really good articles, they're, they're a good brand, um, but they're not as visible organically because of the, the configuration of the platform. Right. Yeah. Um, next one is, what is the best way to drive traffic to pages and keyword usage? I think the best way to drive traffic to pages is to be relevant. Um, and to understand the audience and also making sure that you have the keywords that you need to have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't have to try to get um, one page to rank for a million keywords. Every page has a purpose. Identify that purpose, identify the keywords you want to use, and then that page can rank and be visible. And then in turn, if you do it to all the pages, everyone gets traffic uh, from, from organically. Right, and this one goes off with your meme before. How long can we expect to reap the benefits of SEO yeah. practice? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it does vary. I mean, I've seen instances where SEO can can work very quickly for some places, but sometimes it takes a bit longer. Yeah. Um, I do think it's it's all about um, having a, a, a target and a plan in place. Um, everyone has the big end goal, you know, the big keywords on a rank for, but what's the, what's the, what's the long tail keywords you could be visible for already. Um, and then using that as a method to sort of have quick wins after month one, I have some, I have some traction month two, I've got some more traffic month three, I've got some more traffic. And then, you know, I think six months is a good way to sort of have long term goals, but you can keep going and going and going and going as the market changes as the digital industry changes, adapt your websites to that as user behavior changes adapt your websites to that as well and you can keep reaping the benefits as long as you want really patience yes <laughs> how do i rank my blog using tags yeah so tags um are, can be really important tags is a way of sort of almost filtering by you know what a particular category for that blog um so understanding what people could be filtering by is the key thing for tags and then naming the tags in that way you know, you, you get a lot of websites that talk about fashion, for example, but it could be that you could have tags like tips or going out for certain events or um, you, like weddings or dinners and all that kind of stuff. You have tags for that kind of stuff or material as well. Um, if you can have tags in place for that, then you can optimize your blog. What I would say about tags is if there's no number. You can have high or low numbers of tags. Just make it relevant. Right. Yeah. Okay. And how do you get backlinks when you have no blog? 
yeah it's it's i mean it's not easy <laughs> it's harder a little bit harder if you don't have a blog uh, mm-hmm. but it, it might be that you have a content hub instead so it doesn't have to be a blog it could be somewhere you can put articles about you know who you are what you're doing um i do think you know in terms of backlinks it's about things like videos infographics as well you know they don't need to be on blogs they can be about you know who you are or about us pages or content hub pages um but i do think blogs do help to have backlinks because that's where all, all really good content is and people want to link to that content or share that content um unless you have another way of doing it by videos or um, another one is, I have already SEO'd my web pages. I'm particularly interested in how SEO affiliate, how to have uh, SEO affiliate links. Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, I think SEOing a web page is, is the main way of doing it. I don't think you should SEO your links or touch links too much. Keep it as natural as possible. The one thing you can think about is maybe having your brand mentioned in the, within the link itself. Um, but I wouldn't do any more than that. Right. Um, what are the best practices to monitor search engine performance on an ongoing basis and remain a step ahead of competitors? Yeah, I, I, I think two. Uh, Google Analytics mm-hmm. to monitor your own performance and monitor your own sort of you know engagement on your site is really important. That's one way of doing it. And then second is tools like SEM Rush and Ahrefs and Moz we talked about already. You know, understanding what are you do, how do you, how visible are you for particular keywords or particular topics, and then how how visible are competitors? Um, you might see trends like, for example, you know, um, a, a, a particular competitor was nowhere to be seen, and over the last three months, you've seen that for a particular topic, they've been suddenly ranking really well, and, and they're now a big factor. You know, go look at that competitor, find out who they are, see what they're doing as well. Um, but you would never have known that information if you hadn't put that into SEM Rush already. So right. tools like SEM Rush and Ahrefs and Moz is is one way, but also your own tool of Google Analytics. Is the other. Right. Um, what and where should I put keywords on my website as a holistic health and wellness coach to get shown at top of Google search? Um, I think in terms of keywords, three three popular areas. I think page titles is important have you know because you need to understand you need to tell google and users what your page is about so page size is important the actual h1s as well on a page they can they can incorporate keywords the h1s is you know nothing too big but just a summary of that what that page is about Mm -hmm. and then the content itself so making sure that the keywords are within the content not too spammy make your flow make the content engaging i don't i'm not a big fan of having just keywords for the sake of it if it doesn't flow it doesn't make sense don't do it When you say there are always quick wins, can you name the top five quick wins in general? Yeah, I, I, there are quick wins actually. So some quick wins I've noticed already. Um, page speed is a quick win. If you can optimize your page speed straight away, that that sees improvement in performance uh, for a lot of websites. Um, the other thing I've seen is canonical tags. So people that have don't have canonical tags in place just really do confuse search engines with their with their website. So having canonical tags in place is a, is a quick win for a lot of people. Um, hey, the HTTP is a quick win. A lot of people have the HTTP on their on their website. They have a HTTP version of their website. Sorry, they don't even realize it. Just by fixing that issue, you're you're taking away the di- the dilution of your website credibility, and that improves performance as well. Um, so that's definitely a factor I think in terms of that. Internal linking is another one we talked about it already in terms of a quick win. So many good articles I've read that don't have internal links. Having an internal link can improve the performance from a user perspective and from a search engine perspective as well. Um, and the other quick wins we see a lot for a lot of our clients we're talking about now is their metadata. It's not optimized, you know. And the reason why it's a quick win is because mm-hmm. it doesn't take long to do metadata if you do it properly. But once you've done it, the, the, the benefits are long term. Right. These are some very good quick wins and I encourage everybody to get on top of those. And what happens if you are an online business and don't have a physical address? How does the local prominence work? Yeah, um, so it's harder. There's no denying it's harder, but there are ways of doing it. So in Google My Business, you can now specify just by phone number, have, have a listing up there and you can specify that, you know, you, you provide not just to a local area, but nationwide. Um, so you can do it without the address itself. Um, it's a lot harder to be visible though, I, had, uh, I would say, but you can use things like um, mobile numbers. You can say areas I service. So you can specify areas you service and you can mention areas that you are servicing, even though you don't have a local uh, physical thing. One example could be plumbers, for example, they might not have a physical presence 
in terms of the actual address. They do put one down as their home address sometimes, but they don't, but they can specify the areas they service. Interesting. Early in the presentation, you mentioned unique page titles. What do you mean by unique page titles? Mm. Presumably just unique to our site? Yeah, so unique page titles are where a lot of websites um, have the same page title through several pages. So, you know, one example could be um, blue pen big, blue pen big, and they have it across just because how the system's configured, they don't change the page title. So every page title is the same. It does it, it, it and then unless you go into your CMS and change that page title, it's not going to be unique. The other way of being unique is yeah, to your own site. So what are you about? What do you do? Um, and using keywords like that um, to make yourself unique compared to other pages on the website, but also to your competitors as well. Right. What are current popular social platforms to share content to? Yeah, I think it depends on the platform. So, you know, LinkedIn is good. For example, when you want to, when you want to talk about more of a business approach and you're, and you're, and you're targeting more business audience kind of thing, depending on your businesses, obviously. Um, Facebook is really good for a bit of fun, a bit more fun, a bit more awareness um, approach. Instagram is all about imagery, as you know, and so, so is Pinterest. Uh, so I think it depends on the platform, but, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, the main ones, um, Pinterest, YouTube, obviously big social platform, probably one of the biggest, probably the biggest social platform mm -hmm. I think right now, uh, video content about how to's and what you're doing and documentaries or whatever, whatever the nature of the business is. Basically. Great. How important are search friendly URLs? Can dynamic URLs, example, news slash p news dot ph question mark id equals three eight four <laughs> have a negative impact? Yeah, I think search and friendly URLs are very important in terms of two two angles, the search engines themselves, so they can understand better what that page is about. The second angle is for users as well, you know, for them to see it and make it and make it be understand what that page is about because the URL tells them what it's about and be able to share that and, and go back to that page is easy. Uh, in terms of dynamic URLs, um, I think it does cause confusion because dynamic URLs will change when the page content changes or page whatever the number of products, for example, stuff like that. If that keeps happening, then that's going to cause issues from an indexing perspective. Wow, these are great questions, everyone. Loving it. Sure. Is it okay to edit the published date on a popular blog post on an annual basis, i.e. a yeah. Melbourne Cup Day post from last year? Has its content updated then published with this year's date? Yes, yeah, I think that's the key thing. If the, if the content's been updated and you have gone, you've changed in terms of your some of your benefits or your ideas or your styling tips, for example, then oh, totally, you know, you're not you're not you're not lying. You actually have updated the content to match this year's fashion, this year's tips, for example, and let the user, let search engines know, hey guys, I had this piece of content, I've updated it. The topics the same, but we've put in new material. I would definitely encourage that kind of behavior for sure. Yes, and we have time for one last question, which is, can you overdo keywords in your posts? Yeah, that happens a lot. You, you can see, you know, back in the day, it was very popular to do, but I do think it needs to stop these days in terms of um, you go to, you have articles and say 300 to 500 words. You know, if you mention particular keywords more than three or four times, it just becomes a bit spammy and a bit repetitive. Mm -hmm. Um, what some people can do is have related keywords instead. So if you have a target keyword, for example, you know, um, Melbourne Cup Dress Sense, for example, but Melbourne Cup Dressing, for example, and just change it to something else, you know, dresses to wear on Melbourne Cup, what should I wear kind of thing, um, dresses for events like Melbourne Cup. Don't keep saying the same keywords. Um, I, would, I would use related keywords and I would use different keywords. Great. We had so many questions, so thanks so much for submitting. We haven't had time to go through them all, but we will follow up directly. And thank you again to everyone who joined us today. As usual, we'll be following up with the webinar content link for all those who registered today. If you have any other questions, feel free to email marketing at commissionfactory.com or speak to your Commission Factory account manager. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.